Up next in the broadcast, President Pak kicks off her Four Nation Middle East tour in Kuwait, where both sides make progress in moving beyond oil dependent projects. South Korea and the United States start their annual key resolve military drills, and in apparent defiance of the computerized exercises, North Korea shoots off two short range missiles into the East Sea. And Samsung Electronics unveils its new flagship smartphone line. With flashy specs and design, the tech giant hopes to regain some of the lost market share to Apple's iPhone 6. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I am Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin overseas where the president and her delegation began her Middle East tour in Kuwait, where President Bach held talks with the country's emir, parliamentary speaker, and prime minister. And a number of deals were signed to diversify the two countries' economic cooperation and help create inroads for Korean firms in this region. Our Chaeyoseon files this report from Kuwait City. Kuwait, sitting on the northern edge of the Arabian Peninsula, is Korea's number two supplier of both crude oil and liquefied petroleum gas. But like other Middle Eastern countries, Kuwait is seeking ways to reduce its dependence on petroleum by diversifying its industries. The Bakunhe administration, which has put forth its own plan to spur growth through reform and innovation, wants to upgrade the Korea-Kuwait economic cooperation while giving Korean firms new business and investment opportunities. On the sidelines of President Bak's summit with the Kuwaiti Amir, the two sides signed a deal in which the state-run Korea Electric Power Corporation will supply power-deficient Kuwait with its smart grid technology system that can store renewable energy to meet a rising demand. This latest initiative will help Korea export energy to the region for a change. With the signing of other deals to send experts and share know-how, Seoul has opened the door for Korean companies to partake in Kuwait's national infrastructure projects. One Korean consortium anticipates winning more than half of Kuwait's $14 billion refinery project in the first half of this year, while other Korean firms are looking to win bids in a $22 billion subway construction venture. The two sides also decided to start working together in health care, particularly in medical staff training and hospital management. Kuwait is the only Gulf nation that has a North Korean embassy, and there are some 4,000 North Korean workers residing here. So it was important that President Bak secured greater cooperation with Kuwait on resolving the North Korean nuclear issue and bringing stability to the Korean peninsula. Choi Yusun, Arirang News, Kuwait City. Now, speaking of the inter-Korean relations, the two Koreas have exchanged what they usually do around this time of year. North Korea has fired missiles in reaction to the South's annual military exercises with the U.S., which began today. And Seoul was quick to condemn Pyongyang's hostile reaction. Our Kim Yeun-bin reports. South Korea's defense ministry condemned North Korea Monday for firing two short-range missiles into the East Sea earlier in the day, calling it a violation of UN resolutions, and warned Pyongyang that it will move swiftly to counter any future provocations. The two missiles are presumed to have been short-range scud missiles with an approximate range of 500 kilometers. They were fired into the East Sea from the western port city of Nampo. The ministry says the missile firing is probably the North's way of expressing its opposition to the South Korea-U.S. joint military exercises, which kicked off on the same day. Over 20, 10,000 South Korean troops and around 12,000 American troops are taking part in the annual exercise, which consists of two parts. Part one is the two-week-long key resolve exercise, a computerized command post exercise aimed at enhancing the combined forces' operations and strategy. Part two. It's the eight-week-long Full Eagle field training exercise that aims to enhance interoperability between Korea and the U.S. across all branches of the military during wartime. The annual exercises, which date back to the early 1970s, have long been a source of aggravation for the North, with Pyongyang calling the drills a rehearsal for a Northward invasion. 
So in Washington say the exercises are defensive in nature. Last year, North Korea protested the drills by launching a series of roughly 90 Scud missiles and long-range rockets. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Senior diplomats from UN member countries, including South and North Korea, are expected to have a heated debate this week in Geneva over Pyongyang's human rights abuses. And that won't be all on the agenda, as Seoul will also likely push forward with the denuclearization issue. Our Connie Kim has more. The two Koreas are likely to have a heated debate in Geneva this week over North Korea's dire human rights situation and the regime's nuclear program. North Korea's Foreign Minister Lee Soo-yong will deliver a keynote speech at the UN Human Rights Council on Tuesday, during which he's expected to condemn the adoption of a UN resolution that calls for the North Korean leadership be referred to the International Criminal Court. Pyongyang has been demanding its human rights record be expunged after North Korean defector Shin Dong-hyuk admitted to falsifying parts of his story about his experiences in a prison camp. However, South Korea will refuse to budge on the issue, as Seoul's vice foreign minister Cho Tae-yeol is expected to call for follow-up measures to the UN human rights resolution during his speech. Human rights is a very sensitive issue for the North Korean regime. It seems as though North Korea will use all means and efforts to dodge the issue. The clash is likely to continue during talks over Pyongyang's nuclear program at the Conference on Disarmament. Echoing his comments from the previous UN address, the North Korean minister will almost certainly defend his country's nuclear program by stressing it's necessary for national security. The nuclear issue will be resolved if and when the threat to our sovereignty and right to life is removed. That means the termination of Washington's hostile policy toward our country. South Korea's diplomat will likely call for greater international efforts to push the North to give up its nuclear arms. This will mark the first time for a top North Korean diplomat to address the Human Rights Council and the disarmament conference. Experts say Pyongyang is desperate to counter the swell of international criticism over its human rights abuses and make the case for its widely condemned nuclear weapons program. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And in breaking news, Yonhap reports that Korea's rival political parties have just agreed on the details of a controversial anti-corruption bill that's taken center stage in this month's extra parliamentary session. The new law subjects public officials, journalists and private school teachers to a maximum penalty of three years of imprisonment or five times the amount of money or valuables accepted on gifts worth more than one million Korean won. On the back of today's bipartisan deal, the bill is expected to get a green light at a plenary session tomorrow. Korea has posted a current account surplus every month for almost three years now. The Bank of Korea says January surplus amounted to some seven billion U.S. dollars. Although this is 80 million dollars short of the previous month, Korea is on path to breaking its record of the longest surplus streak set back in 1986. It's not all good news, though, as a bigger drop in imports than in exports. It's what's driving the surplus. Trend in recent months. In January, imports plunged almost 17 percent on the back of falling global oil prices. And another data points that suggest a, uh, a slow recovery for Korea. January industrial output dropped 1.7 percent compared to the month before. This is the biggest margin in almost two years. The government cites a base effect since December production in the mining and manufacturing sectors shot up by the most in more than five years. But output in these sectors in January came down by 3.7 falling the most since the global financial crisis in 2008. Samsung has unveiled its latest Galaxy smartphones. They come armed with a wireless, wirelessly charging batteries and a mobile payment system. Our Shin Zemin has this report. Could this be a game changer for Samsung Electronics? The specifications certainly do seem to make a strong case for that. 
Introduced Sunday at the Samsung Unpacked event ahead of the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, the brand new Samsung Galaxy handsets have a better grip on both design and composition. These are the most advanced pop smartphones in the world with the capabilities no other phone can match. No other phone can match. But that's not all. To use a technical engineering term, they also look really cool. The Galaxy S6 and S6 Edge, which comes with the curved display, sport a dazzling glass and lightweight metal architecture. Both have a faster processor, a better camera, and most importantly, a fast charging battery. Samsung ditched a replaceable battery from the S5 and added a wireless feature. We were the first brand ever to introduce wireless charging that's built in. It's also much faster. The new Galaxy phones only need a 10-minute charge to offer four hours of battery life. Totaling it up, Samsung says it'll take the S6 roughly half the time to charge as the iPhone 6. The phones are also loaded with a mobile payment system called Samsung Pay. Like its Apple counterpart, Samsung Pay uses NFC technology. But unlike Apple, it also has magnetic secure transmission technology developed by Lupe, which allows users to make mobile payments at most places where plastic cards are already accepted. With the flashy new handset duo, the company is hoping to lift its flagging sales and climb back to the top of the global smartphone market after having lost out to Apple last year. Shin Semin, Arirang News. And speaking of smartphones, mobile banking has made life much more convenient, but many still struggle with the crucial first step in gaining access to their account online, authentication. Starting this year, that process could be as simple as touching your credit card to your smartphone. Reports say Korean financial institutions are preparing to launch the new method, which uses near-field communication technology within the first half of this year. If all goes as planned, people won't have to deal with the hassle of verifying each transaction using a security code from their bank. Whether you're a fan of the idea or not, implantable ID chips in humans are no longer the stuff of science fiction, at least not for those working at an office complex in Sweden. Chip manufacturers assure us these devices do no harm to the body, but there are still concerns over privacy and security. Kim and Ji has the details. Forget your keys or leave your company ID card at home. That's no longer a problem for workers at Epicenter, a high-tech office complex in Sweden, as workers can now access things with just a wave of their hand. Their key is a 12-millimeter radio frequency identification chip implant. Uh, it felt pretty scary, but at the same time it feel, felt very modern, very 2015. Employees with the chip implant can get into the office and unlock the photocopier. They can also exchange business cards with people they meet by swiping a hand over their smartphone. Although the chip's functions are limited at this stage, the CEO of the complex expects much more. Payments is, I think, one area. Uh, I think also for healthcare reasons, that you can sort of uh, uh, communicate with your doctor and, and you can get data on what you eat and, and, and sort of what your uh, physical status is. The chip implant is optional for workers in the office complex. The manufacturer says it poses no harm to the human body and will not set off metal detectors and is also safe during MRI scans. But while it may seem innovative and tech savvy, some have voiced concerns that it could be an invasion of privacy and pose a threat to a person's security. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. The top diplomats from the United States and Russia have wrapped up their talks in Geneva as the two world powers continue to clash over the Ukraine crisis. With more, we turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, ties between the Washington and Moscow delegations are at an all-time low, and it looks like this latest meeting didn't do much to thaw those icy relations. 
That's right. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov at a hotel in Geneva, and they spoke for about 80 minutes. But when they did emerge from that closed door meeting, the atmosphere was very tense, and no immediate disc details were disclosed to the media. Shortly after, Kerry posted on Twitter that they had frank discussions about foreign policy issues relating to Ukraine, Syria, and negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. The talks come less than a week after Kerry told Congress that Russian officials had lied to his face about Russia's support of separatists in eastern Ukraine. Though not implicit, Lavrov is all the known to be the only Russian official Kerry has met over the past couple months. He also pushed that fresh sanctions be imposed on Moscow just last week. The two diplomats are slated to discuss, address rather, the UN Human Rights Council later on Monday. As many as 70,000 people marched to the heart of Moscow over the weekend to mourn Russia's opposition leader Boris Nepsov, who was shot dead in front of the Kremlin last Friday. The killing has sparked fierce public backlash, with many of President Putin's critics blaming him directly for the shooting. Officials are investigating the case, but given the political situation in Russia, there are fears that those responsible will never be found. Our Sun Jing in reports. Tens of thousands of people gathered in central Moscow on Sunday carrying Russian flags and marching alongside the river Moskva. The streets were filled with protesters holding placards that said, I am not afraid, in memory of Boris Nemtsov, who was shot dead in the shadow of the Kremlin on Friday evening. Meanwhile, CCTV footage has emerged showing the moment of the shooting. The poor resolution video shows two people, believed to be Nemtsov and his female companion, walking across a bridge in central Moscow before a snow truck moves behind the couple to obscure the view of the shooting. This is not a mere murder, but an act of terror. This is politically motivated, and we need to find the truth behind this terror attack. Police believe there are two suspects involved and have expanded their investigation in search for them. The shooting happened two days before Nemtsov was to speak at a major anti-government rally. He was working on a report presenting evidence that he believed proved Russia was directly involved in the conflict in Ukraine, despite official denials from Moscow that it has supplied separatists with troops and weapons. Boris declared that he would reveal persuasive evidence about the involvement of Russian armed forces in Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin has described the killing as a provocation and pledged to do everything to find and prosecute the killers and punish them. However, there are fears those responsible will never be found. Nemtsov supporters believe shadowy elements in the Russian government were behind the killing of one of Putin's most prominent critics. Son Jong in Arirang News. And turning to China, Prince William from Britain has kicked off his first trip to the mainland on the back of improving relations between the two countries. On Monday, Chinese President Xi Jinping gave a warm welcome to the young prince as he visited the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. During the meeting, William extended an official invitation from Queen Elizabeth for a state visit to Britain, with a stay in Buckingham Palace reportedly in the works. The Duke of Cambridge later toured the Forbidden City and is expected to make stops in Shanghai to promote Britain's brand image and business connections. The visit also marks the first for a senior member of the British royal family in nearly 30 years. And finally, the American space company SpaceX has successfully launched two satellites into Earth's orbit. Space Exploration Technologies said its Falcon 9 rocket blasted off from Cape Canaveral Sunday night, marking its 16th launch. The 68-meter rocket was carrying communication satellites from the Asia Broadcasting System and the French telecom provider Utelsat. It's the first time the private space company founded by billionaire Elon Musk has embarked on a dual launch of satellites into geosynchronous orbit. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Well, if you haven't noticed, we've transitioned from comic books on paper to comic books on the Internet. And now, of course, webtoons, they've evolved into a totally new type of media. Exactly. On this week's Industry Insight, we take a look at what's helped this market to continuously grow here in Korea and what's in store in the near future. Our Kwon Suwa has the story. 
Korea's webtoons are doing better than ever, made possible through the easy accessibility of digital comics. The industry is expected to be worth some 270 million U.S. dollars this year, doubling from two years ago. The webtoon market began in the 2000s during the dot-com wave, but then platforms specifically adapted for smart devices emerged. The popularity of webtoons have also surged due to their recent crossovers into dramas and movies. Webtoons are usually a quick read, so it's no wonder that hundreds of titles are uploaded on web portals every day. Not only has it offered rookie cartoonist opportunities, but businesses have also jumped in to contribute to the virtuous webtoon cycle. It's hard to evaluate webtoons just by their ranking, so we give reviews to help introduce people to webtoons that fit their tastes. Chun Jin Sok, who's busy with his real estate serial Realtor, and Lee Jong Bum, whose psychological thriller webtoon Dr. Frost has been turned into a TV drama, both agree that the boom has fostered intense competition, resulting in better overall quality. But despite this, most webtoons are still enjoyed for free. Back in the day when Koreans had to make do with comics printed in books and magazines like these, they never hesitated to dig into their pockets to buy or even borrow them. The same may happen for webtoons. More platforms are charging money now and many of them don't censor language or content. And with a vast supply of original content, the industry is looking to jump overseas. Webtoons are trying to make their mark in China and Southeast Asia as Internet and smartphone penetration in these regions are high and have gotten much faster. But experts say challenges lie ahead for the industry as it still needs to figure out what genres will appeal most to overseas audiences and how to accurately translate webtoons into foreign languages. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Che with the Sports Brief. Starting off with the live games, let's go to the KBL for the doubleheader. The first game takes us to the tip-off in Incheon. The visiting Mobis Phoebus defeated the ET Land Elephants as Yang dong and Park Gu-young stepped up. Regular season champs will make their final homestand on Wednesday. And over to Changwon, the LG Sakers took down the Samsung Thunders with Chris Massey the driver's seat. LG has been on a roll, picking up their 19th win of 2015. And going over to pro volleyball in the V-League, the women kicked off the action over in Suwon. The visiting IBK Altos defeated the Hyundai ENC Hill State in straight sets behind Destiny and Park jung on the attack. With the win, IBK jumps over Hyundai for second on the standings. And to the men, the Kepco Big Storm beat the Hyundai Capital Skywalkers in five sets after a valiant comeback. Down to nothing, Kepco took home the last three sets in a row for the big win. Moving on, Amy Yang pulled off the victory at the Honda LPGA Thailand this weekend, hoisting her into the top 10 on the Ro Rolex World Rankings. Yang leapfrogged six spots to land at 10th in the world after picking up her second career LPGA title and first in about 17 months. American Le Lexi Thompson dropped the spot to make room for Yang, but other than that, there was little movement in the top 10. Teenage phenom Lydia Ko, Paginbi, and Stacey Lewis kept their positions in the top three. Finally, to tennis, world number three, Rafael Nadal defeated Juan Monaco at the Argentina Open, continuing his brilliance on the clay. Winning in straight sets 6-4 and 6-1, Nadal took home the 46th clay court title in his 13-year pro career to get a step closer to Guillermo Villas' decade-long record of 49 trophies on clay. The 28-year-old also earned his 65th singles title overall, surpassing legends Bjorn Borg and Pete Sampras for fifth on the all-time list. And that wraps it up for sports. Your weather's up next. Good night. Hello, I'm Kim Bo-kyung with your weather forecast. 
Yellow dust is back and it's remaining at higher than normal levels, mostly in the capital regions, and more is set to move in from China on Tuesday evening. And currently, a dry weather watch has been issued for regions along the eastern coast, and hopefully, tomorrow's snow showers will bring up humidity levels. About a centimeter of snow is expected for the central regions, including Seoul, and this should clear up by the evening. Looking ahead, mild conditions are in store through tomorrow morning, but the cold snap awaits after tomorrow and keep in mind that strong cold winds should make things feel much colder than the actual numbers. On to tomorrow's readings. The daytime high here in the capital hits 6, Daegu hits 10, Busan reaches 8. Meanwhile, Taeju reaches up to 12, Tokyo hits 8, Mount Kimgang minus 1. Those are the updates I have for you now. I'll see you soon. And that's primetime news for this Monday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. And I'm Kang Tiri. Have a great evening, everyone. We'll see you again soon.